You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. No matter how much you know or care about gymnastics, you could not have escaped the story of Simone Biles during the Tokyo Olympics. I just felt like it would be a little bit better to take a back seat, uh, work on my mindfulness, and I knew that the girls would do an absolutely great job, and I didn't want to risk the team a medal for uh, kind of my screw-ups because they've worked way too hard for that. So, The expectations riding on the teeny tiny shoulders of one of the greatest athletes the world has ever seen were absolutely massive. And it was just a given that she'd clean up on the gymnastics floor and the beam and the vault and the uneven bars, just like she has at every Olympics and every World Championships since 2013. But that wasn't how it turned out. Hey, were you watching Simone Biles do her vault at the Olympics? Tell me what you noticed. I mean, with the Olympics, obviously, I'm a little bit biased and I've been glued to the gymnastics. Watching Simone firstly in the qualification competition, you notice like she's still performing, but every landing, she like had this really sour look on her face, like, oh, that wasn't good, or oh, that's not my best, or ugh, which is unusual because normally you see Simone perform and she presents and it's just this great big smile and she runs off and she's really excited. So watching that, you know, she still made it into every final, every event, but maybe it's just it wasn't her best performance. Simone withdrew from every event except one after experiencing what gymnasts call the twisties in the middle of her first vault. It's where your mind and your body become disconnected, often in midair. And for Simone, that meant her safety and her life was at risk. You could start telling that, yeah, she has this expectation, whether it's on herself or whether she is feeling that pressure from the entire world to perform at her best and she's not living up to her perceived expectation of that. So it was what it was. And then you watch the team finals and obviously it's three up, three scores count. So, you know, it's a much higher pressure. Russia in the qualifications right up there as well. You sort of knew that, yeah, USA had to bring it. And watching her vault first apparatus was terrifying. That's something we forget about gymnastics when every four years at the Olympics, We watch these tiny girls flipping and flying high in the air in their sparkly leotards with their hair slicked back in tight buns. We forget how incredibly dangerous it is. This has been an incredibly challenging few years for the sport of gymnastics and the girls and the women who compete at the highest levels. Allegations of physical and sexual abuse in various countries have been rife. And one man, Larry Nasser, was the team doctor for the USA gymnastics team for 18 years, where he sexually abused hundreds and hundreds of young girls in his care. Simone Biles was one of them, and he's now in jail. To be competitive in gymnastics, you have to start early, sometimes as early as four years old. But what happens when you reach puberty? And how is the love that so many girls feel for their sport and the passion, how's it tainted by things that they weren't expecting. From Mamma Mia, you're listening to No Filter, a podcast where people from all walks of life tell their stories very candidly and aren't afraid to be vulnerable. The physicality of being a gymnast is something that Olivia Vivian knows intimately. She started training when she was just eight years old. She represented Australia at the 2008 Beijing Olympics. Going into training, afraid to fall, afraid to yeah, make any mistake because I'm thinking about what I'll lose. And She had to submit to regular fat tests. As a girl, I remember you'd like, take us into a separate room and you had a, a professional sort of like with this contraption that would like pinch your skin. I don't know, we called it fat test. As kids, we're like just testing and measuring and calculating it up to what we should be and what range did they want us in for training and for competition. And later, she became a household name on the hit TV show Ninja Warrior. This ninja right here is an inspiration, not just to little girls, to any ninja out there. 
So what goes on behind the scenes of gymnastics? What's it like for those little girls when they become women? And how did she know that it really was time to go? Here's Olivia Vivian. You've been on that Olympic floor before and at many, many other world championships and Commonwealth Games. What's the atmosphere like actually on the floor? Epic. It's epic. Like for me personally, the first time Olympians, so we're all debut Olympians, we trained our butts off. We were ready. We did our, you know, six-week training camp after the selection and we're so glued together as a team. We knew each other. And you step out on that floor and you just have this overwhelming sense of pride that you're there for your country. And at the same time, you're in your bubble. You're doing what you've trained to do a thousand times over. You know your routine inside and out. The pressure comes from when you have to do it when the green light's on and you know that the world is watching. But that, again, is that mental pressure, you know. Your skills haven't changed. Your body's ability hasn't changed. Yeah, the apparatus hasn't changed. It's that mental game that crosses the line. But, yeah, for me, I loved it. I loved every single second. It was we're in the same heat as China and the crowd was just a sea of red. And they had these silly little blow-up toys they were smacking together. And I remember walking out there and my dad and my brother and my family were in fluoro green and yellow, <laughs> just <laughs> screaming their lungs out in this sea of red and yeah it was look it's a high pressure scenario and competition but at the same time this is the comp you've worked your butt up for this is the moment right here you get sort of that one chance out on the podium so I don't know we had a really great lead up and we had great coaches telling us that you know soak it up this will fly by you know it'll be gone within an hour and a half so yeah I was, yeah, really present in the moment and just ready to do my job. How old were you when you competed in Beijing at your first Olympics? I was 19 and I was the oldest gymnast in Australia at the time and my nickname was Grandma at 19. (gasps) So, yeah. It's so interesting because I've been watching a lot of videos of you competing in Beijing and then in the Commonwealth Games a few years later. Oh, look at you. It's called research. (laughs) I'm so good at it. I got to watch you doing gymnastics and call it research. It was great. And you look like a woman. You might have been only 19, but you very much look like a woman. And yet many of your contemporaries in the other teams, including the American teams, look like children. They look like little girls. Tell me about that. Tell me about the body for gymnastics and how that's happened. Because when you look at old footage of gymnastics in the 70s and the 80s and even the 90s, they look like women and now they do look like little girls. I think, you know, if anyone's watched the documentary called Athlete A that came out last year on Netflix, it explains it really well in the sense that this was a woman's sport back in the day until Nadia Comaneci at 14 years old won the Olympic gold medal and it changed. It shifted the sport into, hang on, let's start these girls training younger. And it was almost the manipulation game of these younger kids. We can sort of tell them what to do and they don't really talk back. The physicality of it, Liv, like you went through puberty when you had begun to compete and obviously most competitive gymnasts start, you know, probably what, around some as young as four years old or five years old or eight years old. Yeah. It's inevitable that you tend to go through puberty. What effect does puberty have on the body of a gymnast and how is that perceived by the coaches and within gymnastics itself? My experience, you know, I won't speak on behalf of everyone else. They've got their own journey. It was seen like as a really negative thing. You know, with puberty, naturally the woman's body, it changes, it shifts. And I I remember that specifically. I had to relearn all my skills. I had a different weight and, you know, my muscles was different. That weight to, you know, muscle ratio changes. And, yeah, I didn't feel like it was a very supported transition. It's more like the coaches definitely sort of focus on, you know, what are your skin folds, what's your weight, and can you still do your routines and yeah, it was a hard moment. Did they that monitor was, your weight? Yeah, we had skin folds. What are skin folds? As a girl, I remember you, they'd take us into a separate room and you had a 
a professional sort of like with this contraption that would like pinch your skin. I don't know. We called it fat test as kids. We're like just testing and measuring and calculating it up to what we should be and what range did they want us in for training and for competition. For me personally, I was just always the skinny, bony gymnast who was always under for a long time. So for me, I saw it as a 20, 30-minute break off training. I was like, woohoo. But I remember my teammates like just dreading it, feeling sick and not eating all day if they knew that they had skin folds and crying and yeah, it was hard to watch. I think they've changed it now because it's psychological, like in that crucial point of a kid's development and the brain, the way it goes and mentally what's that doing? But, yeah, it was monitored and, you know, suggested we need you here and here and here to perform. And, again, that comes from back in that Nadia day that just the education that stemmed from above on this is what you need to win gold medals and this is what we need elite gymnasts at. And, yeah, it's just years and years of misinformed education, in my opinion, anyway. How did your life fit around gymnastics like what about school what about friends what about boys evolved around gymnastics and this was at the elite level I remember my club days was all sort of really just fun and happy and about enjoyment and being involved and giving it a go but once it turned elite and quite serious yeah there was no like holidays like I know my family sacrificed a lot it's extremely expensive as well I was the oldest my brother I remember him not being able to do any sports that required payment because all the money went into me. You know, at times my mum didn't eat dinner just so she could put food on the table for my brother and I. There's a lot of sacrifice that goes into it, not just from the athlete, from the family, from everyone. Did you ever feel guilty about that? (laughs) I was such an airy child. I just did what I liked doing and you know, everything else. And yeah, I lived in my own world. But, you know, it did get to a point where, you know, some mum was sort of explaining, no, so much has gone into it, so much money. And, you know, these bills would come through and even just the cost of a leotard that was compulsory. And it did, it started sort of sinking in and weighing up and, yeah, feeling like, wow, like, you know, everyone's given up so much for me. When it did get to that point where, I lost the love for it and, you know, I was thinking about quitting. It weighed in on that decision of me going, I just, yeah, I should do it. Just, you know, it's just a couple more years. That year that you went to the Olympics in Beijing, what's it like in the Olympic Village? Incredible, like amazing. It's the most, again, we were such a, a new team, you know, our head coach had experience, but that was sort of about it and a couple of the coaches. But, yeah, for a lot of us it was the debut and we went over 10 days before our competition. You're like, why? That's so early. The athletes are probably definitely not doing it this year for different reasons. But the biggest one was to get used to all those distractions, this new environment. You know, we're training in four different training gyms. You walk around the village, you're seeing athletes you only see on TV and you're like, oh, my God, what is this? And if you're wearing the same uniform, that green and gold, it was like this mutual understanding that you're together, your family. It didn't matter if you knew each other. It was, hey, hello, this conversation, support, high fives. Yeah, it was the coolest environment. When you heard about Larry Nasser and the fact that he'd been allowed by USA Gymnastics to get away with abusing hundreds of girls over many years... Were you surprised? No. I feel shit saying that even. I'm not surprised because I understand the culture. It's not one of those sports where, you know, you touch the line of the swimming pool and you qualify with your time or you jump a certain high on pole vault and make the qualifying, you know, height. It's our teams are selected by coaches and officials and judges and it's bias, it's subjective if you don't conform, you're out. Like there's so much control that comes from above. Over the years, you feel helpless, you feel voiceless. Like you just have to just fit the mould and do what you're told. 
to reach your goals and reach your dream. And that was the only way. You shut out your parents. I still remember the day I told my mum to just butt out because it caused more problems. If I complained to her about something, then she would say something. Then I felt like I was being punished at the training session. So, yeah, I can see how that happened. Yeah, heartbreaking. Do you think gymnastics is different to other sports in that sense, in the access that I suppose adult men have to little girls' bodies? Um, Look, I'm sure every sport has its issues, has its realms, has its institutions in different countries all over the world. You know, like everyone's going through their own Mm. levels across the globe. But Mm. I think it's just, you know, you're always going to get the coaches or, you know, just people in general that have wrong intentions, I guess. You know, if the coach isn't in it purely just for the athlete, they shouldn't be coaching, you know. It's not about their status. It's not about their status as a coach. It's purely about the athlete and it should be every time. You know, if the athlete doesn't want to do it, that's not the coach's fault. That's, you know, the athlete doesn't want to do it, which is why I feel like it should move back into a woman's sport. So when you're older and you understand and you've had that experience, you do it because you want to do it. You're there because you want to be there, not because you're being told to or forced to or feel like you have to. So, yeah, I'm sure all sports have their challenges. I just know that gymnastics, yeah, has just evolved into a fear culture, thinking that that is the way that you produce Olympic champions when there's so many better ways, there's so many better options. Liv, for those of us who haven't been elite athletes before, what's the difference between a coach like driving you and motivating you and pushing you a bit and being cruel or inappropriate or too hard and too controlling? Yeah. I mean, I can give you examples because, I mean, I grew up in elite Please. sport and then after Beijing I went to Oregon State University in the collegiate gymnastics. I'd already signed my scholarship. I didn't want to go because four more years of gymnastics sounded like the worst thing in the world to me, but I went And it was night and day. I'd come from this environment that was extremely selfish. It was very individual. I felt like I was, you know, threatened most sessions, like you need to do this or our gym will lose funding. You need to hit this routine or you've lost your spot on the team. It came from Mm. threats. And fear-based. Yeah, very fear and to the point where I was terrified to make a mistake, Mm. you know, like going into training afraid to fall, afraid to yeah, make any mistake because I'm thinking about what I'll lose and it eats at you. Yes. It was horrible, honestly, it was horrible. But going into America, like these coaches were just, one, first of all, they cared about you as a person before you were an athlete, so you're a human before you were an athlete, and they treated training. Training's the hard work, the competition was the celebration you take a turn and they would compliment sandwich you. And I was like, what is this? And it was like, you did this really well. You need to work on here. But man, your effort was spot on, like great job. And I was like, what is this? What the fuck is going on? It took me a whole year to get used to it. I fell in love with the sport all over again. I was, this is how it should be done. And I wanted to be better. I wanted to be my best for the team. You know, it was suddenly like it just, yeah, reconnected me to that eight-year-old again, the eight-year-old girl that just wanted to learn all this stuff and it changed me. I learned so much more about what a positive training environment can do. Can you explain what the collegiate system is? They have all colleges competing against colleges and Division 1s are typically schools with big football teams because football will fund the entire sporting program. It's so big there. Then you have Division 2, Division 3, and they all compete against each other and then they have a national championships and America just loves their sport. They get into it so hard. I went there, I joined a team and, you know, Every sort of weekend when you're in season, you're competing against other colleges and then you have a regionals and then a nationals. And, um, yeah, it's a little bit different ruling to the elite system, but it's amazing. It's so cool. And you're dealing with women. You are dealing with women there, not children. Because everyone has to be in college, right? Yes. Yeah. 
So why did you come back for the Commonwealth Games and more world champions? Like why did you put your hand back in the fire? I know. Well, I'd fallen in love with the sport. I came back to Australia after my senior year because I learnt my father got cancer and I wanted to be home and I wanted to be around family. But I was still so in love with this sport and I learnt so much about my body and how to train smart and what I can do. And I really had this like armour of self-belief, like I was the fittest, I was the strongest I'd been and so passionate about the sport again. I came back and I asked to do national championships and they said no. They said you're too old. How old were you? I was 23. So, I mean, I was 19 in Beijing, the oldest then, so nothing's obviously changed. But, yeah, you're too old. Having gymnasts at 24, 23 in Australia just wasn't heard of, wasn't done. But, yeah, once I've got my mind set to something and I truly know that I can, I don't hear anything else but yes. So I begged and I begged and I didn't give up and I pestered them and finally they said okay and two weeks later I went to national champs and got my seventh title on the uneven bars and they were just like, what? And so I got invited back onto the squad and it was a nice moment. I mean, at the time I was just sort of doing something that I loved, that I really truly enjoyed and I wanted to be doing And, yeah, I hadn't been to a Commonwealth Games yet. So getting selected onto the 2014 team was awesome. But I started feeling that elite environment pressure again and just the culture and the lack of support here. Like, it's really hard. Olympics in Australia, being an Olympian, there's not a lot of financial sport. You're More often than not, you're paying to represent your country rather than getting paid to. And, I mean... I had rent, I had bills, you know, and so trying to then manage your work and then trying to train 34 hours a week and represent your country at the highest level 100%. Yeah, it's really difficult to do both. I'm Mia Friedman and you're listening to No Filter with Olivia Vivian, all about the life of an elite gymnast. How did Ninja come about? I'd retired from gymnastics and gone into full-time work I remember it was quiet around 10.30 and my phone rang. I answered it and there's this lady and she's like, hey, so like we'd love um, for you to do this TV show. You know, we'll fly you over to Sydney, we'll put you up in a hotel and you'll just do some like obstacles. Yeah, what do you think? (laughs) And all I was thinking, I was like, cool, free trip to Sydney. (laughs) And then, um, yeah, didn't have any clue what I was doing. I thought I was doing Wipeout. Yeah. That's what I thought I was doing, yeah. So I was like, it's a gag show, it's fine. Haven't trained in years and got there and they show you the course about an hour before you start filming. So you don't get to try it or test it. And I just remember walking out and, oh, my God, my mouth hit the ground. I was just, this was a super-sized playground. This was insane. Somehow I made it to the warp wall. I don't know how. I still look at my run and I'm like, how did you not fall? But... I failed the Wart Wall. I ran into it three times and, yeah, flew back to Perth and I didn't get through the semifinals and I was mad. I was so disappointed and it just lit a fire out within me and I Googled ninja training and there was a ninja academy in Perth. I was like, who has a ninja (laughs) academy? What is this? Like, what is this sport? And I started going there like once a week and then twice a week and three times and they had a warp wall and I just kept training it and failing it and it took me about six months to get the wall. It was far out, yeah. But I fell in love with it and the community was so supportive and I met my partner, my now partner Ben, training there and it flipped my life. It changed at 180, yeah. You're far and away the most successful female ninja. What's it like to be amongst all of that? The first couple of years, I think most ninjas, we had no idea what we were doing and that you good old Aussie spirit of, I'll just give it a crack. I'm just going to give it a crack. Like, and that was the general feel, like whether you're male or female, I'll just give it a crack. And it wasn't until season two I got into the grand final when my goal was just to conquer a what wall. That's when I sort of asked myself, Why was my goal just to conquer one obstacle? Why don't I shift my mindset? And again, this is something I learned in America because here in Australia, we just 
our goal was to get to the Olympics. In America, their goal is to win the Olympics. It was a totally different mindset and I picked that up at college and I, I was like, why don't I try and aim to win? Why can't I win? I guess I understand that the anatomy is different. I will never be able to build that same power and strength in my muscles like the men can, but I can use other aspects. I can use my hips or my movement or find my own way. My mental game changed and my training habits changed and the belief in myself, which is why I think I've sort of advanced so far as a female. I still feel a lot of the other women are just trying to make it into the grand final. That's their goal and that's where I feel like that's not enough. Like you got to go to beat it because these men, they're so strong and they they just keep getting better and it's, it's so hard keeping up with them. Half the time I feel like a delusional optimist. But, yeah, at the end of the day I just ask myself why I do it and it's because I love it. I absolutely love this sport. The community is so supportive and, you know, this is incredible platform to inspire other women and young girls especially to just, yeah, absolutely believe in themselves and go for their goals. But And, yeah, I think the first couple times I made into the grand final as the only female I was like whoop whoop like this is awesome and then the last two years I've really been in that waiting room and I really need the females I need that female army because you do start feeling that expectation that pressure of all the women relying on you now to get through and it weighs on you it weighs on your mind I'd like some more women around that's for sure. It's so interesting watching those videos of you competing as a gymnast and then competing as a ninja and how your athletic ability is obviously they're very different but the gymnastics is all about control and suppression and precision whereas in ninja you're just like throwing yourself into it. (laughs) What's the biggest difference? I think I'm definitely more nervous every time for Ninja than I am ever was at the Olympics. Really? The Olympics, I'd trained my routine like over a thousand times. I knew what I was doing. Whereas you step up on that platform and you're staring down these obstacles that you've never touched before. You have no idea what they're going to feel like. Mm. And all you've done is maybe some visualising how you might be able to get through it but you've never actually tried and it's that fear of yeah, the unknown. I think that's what gets people as, as well as the, the lights and the camera and the fact that it's 1am in the morning when you're filming. So, Did you and your partner meet on the show or in the gym in Perth? Yeah, we met in the gym and for ages I always remembered him as just this, I called him the God. He was like the God. He was like just, he's so tall and he had his blonde hair and he'd always have no shirt on. I don't know, for me, I was like, excuse French, I didn't want to shit where I eat, you Mm. know. Like I loved this Mm. gym. Why the hell would I want to start dating someone and potentially fuck Mm. it up? So, yeah, for the longest time it was like whatever. He's just this gorgeous specimen and I thought he was a bad hugger. That's what I thought. He'd always give you a side hug and I was like, that's shit. He thinks he's a good hugger but back then I don't think he was. (laughs) After season one came out, just a small group of us got together to start creating programs and helpful techniques and tips to help new people get into it And because there is a lot of technical aspect to the movements that make it a lot easier and we wanted to share that. And one of these meetings, the other two members didn't show up and it was just Ben and I and this meeting that normally went for an hour went for like six hours and we got no work done and, yeah, it was just this epic connection. And we've sort of been together ever since. So. How long's it been? Almost four years now. Wow. And having two ninjas in the family, is it just physical all the time? No. Nah. I think because we train hard at home, we're super lazy. Oh, so God. everyone thinks like it's a competition to get to the fridge or, you know. Yeah, like having. You're going to get to the door fast. Or having yeah. sex, like swinging upside down yeah. from, oh, yeah. you know, a pole <laughs> 50 foot in the air. <laughs> I know, I know, so funny. High degrees Um, of difficulty. We are just normal people. One last question before I let you go. When you were a gymnast, what were some of the most confronting things that you saw, perhaps behaviour among other gymnasts or interactions between coaches and gymnasts? I feel terrible saying this, but I know it's just the way I've been brought up in this environment 
everything that, you know, I now know is not right, you know, anyone would see today and go, that's wrong, was normal. It happens so often that it's normalised. So, you know, just stuff like just yelling abuse and telling girls that they're worthless and they're stupid and a lot of just putting people down or threats or, you know, telling girls that they're too fat and, you know, stuff that you would look at now and go, that is so wrong, that's not right, was normal and it happened every day. What I think sticks out in my mind is the stuff that I see after, just girls going into severe depression and having absolutely no support. Like I remember when I retired, I didn't retire, I got a a letter from the Institute of Sport telling me I was retired. You know, for me, I was like, I need a break. For them, it was like, congratulations on your retirement. You just see this like, we'll use you as an athlete to get what we need out of you and then that's it, you're done. Like, goodbye, good luck. There's no followed on support and a lot of girls left with like severe injury and their bodies and 18 years old and can't get out of bed because they're so sore and stiff and all their bones are cracking. It's stuff that I've seen friends and teammates go through after that's hard, that's really hard. Are there concrete things that you believe should change that could make a difference? I think especially since last year, it is changing. It's sort of impossible not to. We aren't. We now know like what is not acceptable. And so I think, you know, once we make gymnastics like a little bit more transparent, like we had this gym and this cafe above it that had, you know, soundproof glass, but parents weren't allowed to stay 15 minutes after the session had started and they couldn't come up and watch 15 minutes before we'd ended you know, so it was sort of like you're shutting these parents out. No wonder they get frustrated. They have no idea what's going on. And if glass is soundproof, you can't even hear what these coaches are saying. So once we sort of make that a little bit more transparent, everyone's on the same page. Everyone will know what is, you know, proper athlete safety. You know, I'd like to say, like, I'd love to see the age limit for the Olympics or senior go up to 18. I'm not sure if it'll happen, but, you know, again, trying to, push it more towards a woman's sport um, Mm. and longevity. Mm. Yeah, I think once we've corrected the education, it'll all sort of flow down. Thank you for listening to No Filter. If you liked this episode and you want to hear more, a couple of years ago I interviewed an American gymnast called Ali Raisman. She was the captain of the American Olympics team when it won gold and Simone was actually in that team. Ali was her team captain and she was another of Larry Nassar's victims and she was in Australia a couple of years ago to do a like a demonstration kind of event and we had an amazing phone call where we spoke about what her life has been like, what it has been like to feel betrayed by the sport that she loves so much and uh, how she's moved beyond what happened to her with Larry Nassar. It's really, really interesting. We'll put a link in the show notes. And also, if you want to share this with someone or leave a rating on your podcast app, that really helps us to keep making the show and to help more people to find it. We will also put the documentary that Liv recommended, Athlete A. We'll put a link to that in the show notes as well. And if you want to hear more from me, if you haven't had enough, imagine that. Listen to Mamma Mia Out Loud. That's the podcast that I co-host with Holly Wainwright and Jessie Stevens. And the three of us talk about all the topics that women are actually talking about three times a week. The assistant producer of No Filter is Lucy Neville. The executive producer is Eliza Ratliff. And I'm Mia Friedman. I'll see you on the Mamma Mia app where you can read all our articles and hear all our podcasts. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of the land we have recorded this podcast on, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. We pay our respects to their elders, past and present, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures.